Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. On today's show, we have Ruth Taylor, Senior Product Manager of the Advanced Lighting Group at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We're all a little nervous. But before we get into that, what we want to tell you real quick is about the gangsters. Greg Eric, Satco, go to satco.com, the gangsters of lighting, family business, family run. We love those guys. What do they got, Greg? Speaking of family, they've got a system that they named after the founder of Satco called Starfish. These are powerful words here, Mike, and it says it right on their website. Connection, security, atmosphere, convenience, and wellness. Satco Starfish is to live life enlightened. They have bulbs, cans, outlets, switches, tape light, string light, all RGB, dimmable interior, exterior, um, and controllable on an app. So you can always connect to your lighting at home with the Starfish. Big move by Satco. Go to satco.com and longtime proud members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. This association is moving and shaking. We're we're working on the dark sky issues. Um, We're launching another podcast coming out hot soon. There's going to be a third show that Nail's promoting. This association, we have so much educational products for all the all you people in distribution out there. If you're an electrical distributor, if you're a lighting distributor, you need to join us. Go to naald.org. But for right now, we're going to talk to Ruth Taylor. Hello, Ruth Taylor. Hi. Say hello to Greg Eric. Nope. Hi, Greg. Hi. <laughs> hi, Ruth. <laughs> Second or third high, but there's a, there's an official recorded one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so to start off with, Ruth, let's get a little background. You, you've got a, a lot going on. What, what do you do exactly? What's your title? What's your role? Well, my, my title is a program manager, project manager. Um, I work for Pacific Northwest National Lab. We do um, research, uh, solid state lighting research for Department of Energy so I've spent most of my career, um, or, or the last 10 years at least, working on the solid state lighting team um, and manage the next generation luminaires design competition for about 10 years. And then that has morphed into a set of living labs we have where we're really looking at the configuration complexity problems with these connected lighting systems. So that's how I spend my time. Now. Yeah, one of the, the questions I always have is, is so PNNL, and Department of Energy, how are they, are they the same or are they related or why are they always together? What's that all about? Well, well, Department of Energy has a number of national labs across the country that they, uh, and and Pacific Northwest National Lab, we're, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, there's a broad range of, of research we do there from national security to products, all kinds of cool stuff, but we have a lot of energy efficiency buildings work there, and the DOE's main lighting lab is um, uh, mostly in the Portland office for for the lab. The the mothership is in Richland, Washington, and there's about 4,200 employees there, a smaller group of us, 25, 30, probably in the Portland office, and then several remote workers like me. So all of the, the lighting work, though, is done in the, in the Portland? office for the department of energy for the most part we we are considered their core lighting lab so they decided a few years ago to have core sort of research areas so they'll have an hvac lab or a building you know and so we're the we're the designated lighting labs we have some some folks in richland that work we have a um, we used to do more work, the Caliper program, and all that was done uh, in Richland. So we do have some folks there, but most of the folks are in Portland. In Got it. And so, team. And it, good. And it says currently you manage a next generation lighting system program. Right. Tell us about that program more in, in detail. Okay. Um, I don't like the sound of that. We are, we're having trouble with this generation. We have enough trouble in, in the generation <laughs> we're in. <laughs> I know we we always question that name. It's like, is this really next generation? But it sounded like a cool name when we came up with it. Uh, and in the beginning, it's 2007, 2008, um, when, you know, Wild Wild West, all kinds of crazy products, uh, we started 
a, a design competition kind of grew out of lighting for tomorrow. I worked on that program too. We decided to have a commercial program. So we spent about 10 years in which I brought um, lighting designers, utility folks from all over the country. And we would look at a hundred to 150 products at a time. We had a catalog and, you know, help specifiers really um, get through, you know, figure out what's okay uh, to specify because they were having so many folks come into their offices and they couldn't, you know, they were, didn't really know how to evaluate the products. So we had people actually come on site to look at these products installed. So it's from the very beginning, it's been a very people centric um, that we really need to touch and take the products apart and really see how they perform um, looking at them. Once controls, connected lighting systems started coming into the picture, we began to see quickly that those are really hard to evaluate, right? You can't just bring in a luminaire and plug it into something and, you know, to figure out whether it dims okay or, or whatever. So we grew into now we have, um, we are installing full systems um, in, in into, we have a, a living lab at Parsons School of Design in which we installed 14 systems. And then we have an outdoor lab at Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. So we are looking at the entire process with the people focus, right? So we call what we do observational research. So we're really trying to nail down the configuration complexity problem. So there's lots of things in the way of these connected lighting systems getting implemented correctly, you know, People don't understand them. They, they're just not good education. They haven't used them, all of that. Well, we, we really saw that we needed to actually um, be hands-on. So we sit and watch these systems being installed. So we bring in naive installers who are not familiar with the systems. Um, they install one system at a time, so they're not learning as they go. And we just watch the process. We see if they can understand the documentation. They see if they can figure out the phone app. We see if they can, you know, how they do it, what, what sort of breaks down in the process because we're learning that it's not just the technology where there can be issues. It's really that connection between the people and the technology and when, and how, how it fits into how they normally do business and all of that. So we're spending a lot of time um, trying to, to um, ascertain those problems and then communicate back to the manufacturers as well as with specifiers and, and others in the industry about what to look for and how the systems compare and all that. Nice. So to break down a little bit, the indoor um, living lab, you have 14 systems. Does that mean you have 14 different manufacturers in there? Yes. Um, now, now sometimes we we allow partnerships. So in in some cases, we'll have systems that they pr provide the entire system, the luminaire and the and the controls and everything. In other cases, you know the Lutrons, Crestrons, those kind of guys of the world, it'll be a partnership. So they'll have different luminaires um, that they use. So sometimes there's some repeats in in companies as far as those those. Uh, partnerships, but they are 14 unique different uh, systems. They have their own room. They have their own setup that, you know, all, all of that. Who chooses uh, the 14 or, or how do they apply for it or how does that work out? Well, we, we have a set of requirements. So when, fr from the very beginning, we set out to sort of narrow down what we were looking at so that we um, were comparing apples to apples. Um, so you don't want to compare, I mean, we, Creed to enlightened, right? You know, I mean, they're, they're so vastly different in their capabilities. So we were trying to keep it narrowed down. So our first set of specs or requirements were focused around um, easy to install, out of the box, self-commissioning. That's all the words that were being used in, in 2017. <laughs> yeah, we didn't find anything self-commissioning or right out of the box, but we wanted to test that premise, right? So we knew looking at some of the systems that probably that might not be, but they were being marketed that way, right? So that was the determiner. If, if in their literature, they were saying, hey, you don't have to have a manufacturer rep on site you can get this out of the box and 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 turn everything on and it's going to find you know it's going to do its thing and it's going to be really easy to do that was the first set of systems so we had other criteria you know 
wireless things and, and ways of communication that we kind of, so that we could, you know, compare apples to apples. But then it was an open call, right? Anybody can, um, anybody can participate if they can meet those specs and get their system to us and, and all of that. And we've had three different iterations. The first, we had seven systems installed first, um, these easy systems that had new luminaires. We next did five systems that had retrofit kits. So uh, they replaced all the guts, but they still were a connected system that operated the same way. And th then we had a couple, couple more stragglers. And then we were probably, we're talking to some folks now um, cause I like, uh, as many, the more systems we can have, the better job we can do at comparing and contrasting and giving um, industry a feel for, for what's out there. So we'll probably install, um, now we're getting, Parsons should open up here pretty soon. We can get back into the rooms, install three or four more systems. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the host talk eventually here, but I've got a lot of questions on how this process <laughs> works. So the, it started in 2017. Is that right? Is that what you the said? Very, the very, yeah, the very first systems we we installed them. Okay, and then you're you're continuing to install now. And how long? I read somewhere you were evaluating for two years. And then what's your ultimate goal? I know I'm asking a lot, but kind of just flow through it. Yeah, I, yeah. We we used the two years word to start. It was sort of like at least two years. Um, but as this has gone on, we really are we are terming these are living labs. So the systems are going to stay operational. We are allowing manufacturers to upgrade their systems if they want to. Some of them have not performed so well. And so we're giving them the opportunity to just replace the entire system to show us, you, you know, what they've got. Other systems which are performing well, um, we're working with Parsons um, facilities, uh, VP, they're really interested in seeing some of these systems, seeing them a little more. And so we're going to give some of these manufacturers an opportunity to install over a, an entire floor so that they can have multiple luminaire types and, and uh, really see how the system operates on a larger scale. So we envision these systems to be installed indefinitely at, at this point. Um, and because that's part of the process that we're seeing is very important that we didn't really anticipate was the upgradability, um, uh, you know, firmware updates and, and all, all kinds of things as facility staff is trying to figure them out. Can they can they do that themselves? Can users figure out how to use the, the rooms and all that? So we're watching them as they live and breathe in in these facilities. So it's a it's an so, interesting opportunity, I think. What what is the ultimate goal then? Are you going to take this information and provide rankings to the people that buy and sell lighting, or or what are we going to get out of this? Um, we don't provide rankings. Um, at at the beginning, I think we thought that it would because we grew out of a competition in which we did exactly that. We had winners and and losers, but we soon began to realize that that would not be as helpful as providing the industry with an overall look at what's going on. And that, that puts manufacturers in a place where they can feel comfortable um, putting their products that sometimes are in development that aren't, you know, um, that they haven't been out in the field a long time. And so it allows them, you know, this opportunity. We feel like we're all learning together. So when we, point out issues, they're broad issues, like six of the 14 systems failed in this way or couldn't do this or had, had issues rather than saying this particular manufacturer is really messed up in this area. Uh, sometimes we'll name names if they did a really good job on, on a particular thing, but but typically not. We, we make it very public who's involved uh, so that everybody knows that we have uh, what I call the big boys, right? We, you have to have enough representation of what you would really buy, what, you know, can't be just all startups and, and, and um, fake products. Uh, but we don't, we don't point fingers and, and uh, we want everybody to learn together. So we provide very pretty tight feedback loops to the manufacturers we have comfort conference calls with them. We provide them all of our judging notes. We provide them video. We um, allow them to come into the space. We have duct tape so that they can't 
talk, uh, but they can observe while the manufa- while the installers cannot figure out what's going on. They just have to sit there and watch and see, oh, God, oh, I would have ne- we heard We've heard this so many times. I, I don't know why that's happening. I, I, I can't believe that happened because you can't, if you're doing some sort of pilot and, and demo of your own product, you're constantly intervening, right? Oh, oh no, do this, do this. Do, yeah, uh, uh, you know, you're, and so you don't really know what's really going to happen, totally. right? And if you stand, stand back and just watch, it's fl- it is flabbergasting what people will do. I mean, we're, we're just crazy, messy People, you know, we just can't, we do really crazy things and you, and it's, has turned out to be very helpful to just watch it happen. Um, and user experience is the most <laughs> user UX or user experience is the most fascinating part of software development to watch people try to use a new software. You know, Greg, you're a pretty good podcast host, buddy. You should start your own show actually. <laughs> I was, that was really interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want to kind of, you know, I, I want to kind of take this in like a, a bit of a different direction here, Ruth, and I, and I, it's going to take me a minute or two to unpack it. Um, do you remember what? Do you remember Blackberries? I'm sure you do. Remember Blackberries? Oh, um, I loved my Blackberry. I still have one. So, <laughs> but well, so, my <laughs> do you? Do you guys remember the moment the iPhone came out? Which you know, the you know, Blackberry was a great company. They slayed a lot of giants, and then Apple finally, the last Goliath, they couldn't kill them, and Apple won the war. But do you remember the moment when the first guy cracked the Apple iPhone and built his own app, and Apple didn't do anything? Do you remember that moment? It was like 2008 or nine. And some kid in Arizona or something had cracked into the operating system and was doing development. And Apple was like, well, hang on a second here. And then they made the app store. I don't know if you guys remember that moment. Right. The iPhone, that moment, 2008 or 2009, technology went from being about helping people and making them more productive and turned in and morphed into an exercise in information and data extraction. Like it changed. So a BlackBerry was a productivity tool. Uh, an iPhone or a Samsung, whatever, is really an information extractor. Most of the, the power of the phone is not, does not go to give the user productivity tools. It goes to take information from the user and give it to other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when I look at the evolution of lighting controls, now I've done many lighting control projects in my career, okay? occupancy controls and giant garages, you know, and we, st- we still use dumb sensors with relays and low voltage wire, not connected, they're commissioned in the field and they work fantastic. And it solves all the, like there's no connected system that would be able to deliver more energy savings that I've seen than I can do with just basic passive infrared ultrasonic occupancy sensors with relays and that sort of stuff. Nothing I've seen so far can do that. And those things only introduce complexity. And I'm not sure that they add any value. Okay. Now we can talk about human centric lighting and tuning and these other things where, you know, perhaps there's, there's, there's more value there. But what Ruth is the goal or the purpose of these control systems? What do they purport to deliver to the user or the person paying the energy bill or the person in the space? that is different from analog controls that you can do already? Well, I think there's um, lots of discussion around this and, and um, there, there, because the, because the energy story is right. I mean, in that, in that um, if you're just looking at, at that comparison, you're not, you're not going to get that much more energy savings, um, perhaps with, with controls, uh, I mean, with the, with these connected controls, but the add-ons to that, um, is what's interesting, everyone, uh, interesting, everyone. Um, and we've got some projects where we're looking at, you know, integrating with HVAC and, you know, plug loads. And then you're, you know, the whole idea of getting people back in the office after COVID and, and, um, and energy reporting. We're highly interested in, in doing a lot of work on interoperability and, and energy reporting and trying to figure out, you know, what's really going on with your, with your system and, and working past that. So, um, 
I'm probably not the best one to answer that. I mean, my work is very focused on the the complexity issue and and the and the people issue and that and that the, the value that's here let everyone else sort of you know figure out what that is and what people need and and where it's going to go and how much energy could be saved and maybe we don't even totally understand you know all the ways where it's going to go but i tell you what if we can't figure out the people problem if we can't get stuff to work right if we can't make that connection for sure, it's not going to do any of those things we want it to do, whether it's it's energy or, or other benefits uh, to the owner. Um, I don't know if I, I if, if I if well, I, I think we're having a discussion. Away. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something back at you based on based on your answer. Like I don't know who the customer is. That, that's where you know for me or like who you know who is going to pay and why are they going to pay and you know, why would they be interested? So I understand there's certain applications that are, you know, control centric, you know, stadiums, uh, arenas, places where you have lighting control, like systems, the lighting system is part of the entertainment. Like that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, there's obvious reasons you're gonna have a professional guy there who's an audio video technician who's going to be running the controls and that that person has a job and now they're going to, it's going to be easier for them. It's going to be digital. It's going to be this, and they're going to be able to do more stuff and change colors and all that. I understand that those applications, but I think what you're talking about is in the general commercial environment, right? An office building where you want to gather information or gather, you know, it's, you know, you mentioned that. Can we get information about plug load? Can we get information? Is it another data play? Like, is, is the industry need to change gears away from the energy story and move to more that, you know what? Actually, information about how much individual devices in this building, energy in the devices in this building are using is actually quite valuable. And here's how you can mm -hmm. use it. And if you know that energy is being used in a space and nobody's there, these is, this is valuable information. Um, I have never seen that. I, 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 I don't think I've seen a system that is, is holistically planned outside of lighting. So I don't see the value of that information if it does not include the other devices in, in the space and that it's not connected to HVAC. So I see it, I see maybe as a larger facilities management play. But, you know, lighting seems to think that it's the host of this or that lighting seems to think that lighting is the, 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 the is going to be the backbone of the controlled building or something. I'm not sure that's true. And so I, I think as an industry, Ruth, we need to identify what the value of this is going to be to the customers. If you want to see mass adoption and we need to figure out who the actual customer is. Is it the utility? Is it the, is it the building owner? Is it the building occupant? Is it a company that just wants information on how the building is used. Who's the customer? And that's my, my, my trouble with controls, with not controls, but with um, accessible digital controls and addressable mm -hmm. controls is understanding why anyone would want this and why they would want to pay significantly more for it because it costs a lot more. Do you have an answer to that question? <laughs> well, I think, I think all those that you mentioned are the are the cut are, can be the customer, right? I mean, I think it it all depends on where you're coming from, and I think things are are moving towards being more more integrated, you know, with other systems in the building. And it's lighting is the vehicle, right? I mean, lighting is everywhere. And I and I when they were we were first talking about this, it would we were we would have the conversations like, man, we we are going to get run over by these folks if we don't get in the game because you know the, the IT folks and, and access to the building and access to what's going on and and all that connectedness and since you know they they could see oh man if we can just get in every fixture if we can just that's that's our vehicle to to the building um and, and allows us allows us to do that and they're they're going to run the show if we don't step in and and be a part of this game um and at that point we thought it was going to move way faster than it has that was we started having these connected lighting summit meetings and bring in, you know industry people in you know how can doe help and you know where's everything going and it was just like whew, 
this is, you know, this is gonna, mm -hmm. this is gonna take over the world tomorrow, you know, and it just hasn't. And now everybody is stopping and saying, what, what in the heck is going on? That everybody's having problems. No, the, the commissioning process is taking forever. And, and, you know, from DOE's perspective, it's like, we don't want this happening again, like it did with CFLs. And, and, and so we, you know, we came in with the LEDs to try to make sure there's good products and people understand and there's education. It's kind of the same thing here here uh you know if you listen to all the providers the main face like oh man this is so easy you can do this it's just going to do it on its own and it's mm. just we're going to take over the world yeah, the promises and, promises yeah yeah and you get it in the field and 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 you know there's a lot of owners that are saying that it's like okay no I'm not, I'm not going to touch this until it gets figured out. I don't understand. We can't get it to work right or people don't like it. There's so much potential, but it doesn't work right. And it gets disabled. And so that's really where my, my focus is on that part of the problem. Why, why are these systems not living up to their potential and, and doing what, what they've said they're going to do? It, is it, we believe it, it in some time, in some instances, it's the technology, but many, many instances, it's the connection with the people and the technology. Uh, that we people really don't want alerts on their do. phone from their lighting system. Like I try to, I try yeah. to, ex I mean, <laughs> I, you know, you take a look at some products, like maybe in your house, your kids want to be able to play with the lights on their phone and maybe you do for a party. And so the home is a different application, but Nobody really cares about that from the industry. I mean, it, what we're talking about here is large facilities, you know, buildings that are many, many people go to. And we're trying to look for a value proposition. Complexity introduces significant amounts of cost. And I, I don't think a lot of people understand that. As soon as you layer something on top of another level, so you now you have, say, um, a, you know, you've changed the way, like a lot of people don't understand how difficult it is for people that are not in the lighting industry to maintain the, the, the deployed base of LED light fixtures or to look at them as something that they own now, the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, mm -hmm. you changed a light bulb. That makes a lot of sense to people. You know what I'm saying? Where do I buy the light bulb? Right. There is no light bulb. Right. Well, what do you have to do? The, the, life, you know, the life cycle of that fixture is only seven years. What do you mean? The last fixtures we bought were from 1970 and we maintained them for 50 years. Yeah. No, the new light fixtures are a seven year life cycle and then you have to change it again. And not only do you have to change it again, but now you got to connect it. And then not only you have to connect it, but you have to have somebody managing those controls. What do you want to do with those controls? I don't know, but you can manage them if you want. You know, it's like, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I just want the light on, you know, I mean, I hate to say that. And I, I think that there's a massive over focus, Ruth, in the interior space where nobody even knows who the customer is or what you know, what the, what the value proposition is or why people should even pay for it. When the total focus of this technology should be for outdoor lighting to implement dark sky policies. It, it, it's so obvious. The control argument for street lighting and municipal lighting is absolutely obvious. Those people could afford to have somebody, hey, the cops need, the police, the firefighters need to have the lights turned up to 100% in this area because there's a crime investigation or there's a change to 5,000 Kelvin or turn it off because the birds are migrating and the turtles are hatching this weekend. There's a massive argument for controls in municipal street lighting and outdoor lighting and everybody seems to be focused in the wrong direction in my opinion and it, it just dark skies alone is enough but th there's all sorts of layers there where you have the people you can train the people the resources are there and the and the argument can be made and i don't see the focus on outdoor street lighting i know there is controls for outdoor street lighting but i don't see you know the industry really focused on that area and i wonder to myself why do you know why well we we are focusing on, we have an outdoor living lab in which we have six systems in, in, installed and they, they are, you know, you're, you're right. Outdoor has, is way ahead and, and, and their system, they have a, several companies have really good systems. And we, we, we set that the next bar for, uh, 
parking lots is the presence detection. So we really focused our evaluation not only on on the system and its reporting and, you know, can they tell if a fixture's out and, you know, all those things that they've gotten really good at. But what about the presence detection capabilities? And when we added that on to these systems, every single system uh, had trouble. And so it, it, it is a, sort of the next step in the outdoor arena because it is a really big deal for these you know, p- parking lots and such for safety and, and security. And, and owners need to have confidence that these sensors are going to work properly. But when you put these sensors on 30 foot poles and you have trees, and and um deer wandering wildlife in and out. Sure. you know yeah yeah, sure. yeah all, all, all kinds of things and then when you have the the issues with the system itself you've got your gateway so you have latency issues and that you know the sensor senses a car coming in but it's got to talk to the gateway to tell it to do something about that motion that it sees well the car's already out of the parking lot you know we a lot of those so there are a lot of in, in, intricacies of of that problem um that we're working on yeah on they got to be edge based side. it has to be edge computing it can't be it can't be yes. cloud it has to be edge computing um it has to yeah. know what to do yeah. right away um I, I i wonder you know for me the outdoor lighting um area is by f- like the business case is totally obvious to me and why people would want to do it um mm-hmm. do you guys but you know you have you have a lot um like can software operate at negative 30 i mean you know in, in a place like minneapolis it, you know can a sensor work can, does electronics even work? I mean, it gets fr- really cold in Minnesota, you know, and, in, and never mind Canada. <laughs> Winnipeg is, you know, another yeah. 2,000 miles north of, uh, of Minneapolis. So, you know, these areas, there's challenges there. Um, how are, are you guys investigating those extreme applications as well? Well, we, we are. Interestingly, because of all the things we saw, you know, in our evaluations in, in these six parking lots, we really saw that the, the, the sensor technology in this outdoor environment was really lacking. PIRs do not work so well um, in, in this situation. No. So we are now contracting with, with Ron Gibbons, VTTI, and their team to, to try to develop a, a sensor protocol, a testing protocol. So the part of that that he's doing uh, some really interesting work, he's got, and he started it this winter, um, folks dressed up in different layers of, uh, of their coats and their hats, you know, to see what mm-hmm. that, that temperature d- differential is mm-hmm. and how it changes as to how much clothing they have on and when it, when it trips the sensor because of that. And then in the, in, in the summer, you've got your hot asphalt and you've got people walking by and there's not enough to, you know, so we're kind of putting some parameters on those things mm-hmm. of what the technology uh, can actually do in some of these more, uh, extreme conditions. So that's, that's underway. So we don't know all the, all the answers to that, but what designers, specifiers have really told us they would love to see is that just like you can see, um, lighting distribution on your, on your parking, like you need to be able to see d- distribution, uh, of the, what, of the sensor coverage that mm-hmm. you can overlap in those plans mm-hmm. sure. and be able to put it in, put it in, you know, j- put it in your AGI 32, you know, j- t- so sure. you really, cause there's, big differences in what those sensors can cover to what the light can cover. So we're working towards, you know, working with IES to, 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 to try to work towards that, that goal. We're not sure whether we can pull it off yet, but I think several go, no goes. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's interesting about, so I don't, we, I've deployed a lot of interior analog lighting control systems that work fantastic. Okay. And I think the people doing these advanced controls could learn from how we do the analog controls actually a lot um, in terms of seeing how we make these systems perfectly effective in a parking. Let's, one of the things that a lot of people um, don't, don't know or, or they, they kind of in a way, they, they want the space itself to be controlling, right? So you enter the space. What you really need is the controls in the pre-space so what you want is you want that foyer to the parking garage to have the sensors in it so that before people get to the parking garage and it's, and it's cut off and commissioned with, you know, paint, you know, we paint the side of it. So if someone goes this way, it doesn't trip the system, but if they go this way, it does, right? And you, we call those scout sensors. 
So we, 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 we note all the various ways people can enter the, the space and we, we put scout sensors there. And then you also have the sensors in the garage. There's a lot of learnings that people could do from, you know, contractors and, and distributors like Greg and I who do these analog systems and they could understand, you know, how you have to more than software, you have to understand how people enter that space and what they need from the lighting system when they get in there. People don't want lights mm -hmm. coming on in garages after they've entered the space. They don't want mm -hmm. lights coming on in parking lots when they're halfway through the parking lot. It's, that's, that's almost right. more dangerous, you know? Yeah. So I, I think they're trying to reinvent something. Um, it's, it's almost like what happened with LEDs where we reintroduced the flicker issue um, that we had eliminated with T8 electronic ballasts. It's like this, we already solved that problem. Oh, let's re we reintroduce it. It's like, <laughs> what do we, how did people do these analog systems so amazing in 2000, 1995 and 2000 and 2005? I'm still installing them today and they work great. Um, how, did, how did they do that? And then can we add a digital element to that? Instead of like trying to reinvent everything on the other side. Um, so over to you, Greg. <laughs> There's my yeah, beef. No, that's fine. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, um, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm curious more on these living labs. So you, we talked about the inside. Now the outside. You said it was six parking lots, um, and it kind of relates to both. But it, you said you're doing apples to apples. So are you guys saying put up a an area light that's a type three, eighteen thousand lumen, five k, four k, whatever, and everybody has to do that? Or are you letting people change to some degree? Um. Yeah. Some. We, we, we give them the, for the outdoor example, we give them their right. actual parking lot, right? So they, they design it as they would for a customer. I mean, it does have to function for it's at the Virginia tech corporate research center. So the owners of those buildings and those lots, you know, they're, they're using them and it has to function for them. Uh, we, we do give them a, uh, you know, a color temperature we want them to meet. We, you know, but, but, but as far as the type and layout, we, you know, we let them do that. And then we, you know, we review it. And then there are certain requirements for the, the connected system, you know, that we need, we need certain kinds of energy reporting and, and we had, they had to have the, the presence detection, have the occupancy sensors there. Um, and again, they could be, a it, it, it could be a, um, collaboration of companies or one company to, to do the whole thing. So it, it's a fairly loose performance kind of spec, but just enough where the capability, because a lot of these companies have like um, layers of, of, you know, their simplest system all the way up to their super complex meant for an entire city. And, you know, we don't, we don't need the complexity of those, those largest uh, systems. So we tried to even of their offerings, choose the one that best fit, um, you know, so, so all the entrants could be compared. Um, you know, they're not, it's not exactly, but as, as close as we could. Do you publicize and, and label the areas? Like I assume those six being exterior, I could go drive to them if I wanted. You could drive to them. We don't have signs. Um, <laughs> right. PNL <laughs> is doing an experiment on this parking yeah, lot. This is, this is the Lotron lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like if it's well, marketed some, to end users to be able to see well, or customers some, or lighting people. Some of, yeah, some of the manufacturers actually have come out and their marketing people have, you know, done, d done little clips, you know, about here's, you know, we're a part of this, th this research project. And, um, but I would, I would say most of them don't want to toot their horn too much at this point, because mostly we're publishing all the issues. Um, that <laughs> <laughs> that, that, have, that have gone on. I mean, I mean, it it, it, it was a difficult problem we we gave them for, for sure. I mean, sure. why do it if it's not a difficult problem? Um, so, yeah, we don't we we don't Is associate he... the specifics. Go sure. ahead. Yeah. Is the interior one open for anybody to go, or at least lighting professionals or anyone to be able to see this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're functioning classrooms. In fact, we did have at one point 18 or 19, we had, um, uh, 
a chapter of IES there in New York that came in and we had an open house and and people could walk through and we demonstrated each of each of the systems and um, so, so in that case, it was super open to the public, but, you know, if you could get in the building, you could see any of them, you wouldn't necessar necessarily know what's there. Um, but, you know, we've talked about labeling the room, you know, um, putting, putting something on the door to say, this is part of the, part of the living lab, but everything's been closed, you know, for, for the last year or more. So we haven't kind of taken it that, that next step. Yeah, the reason I'm asking a lot of this is I, I, it'd be something I'd be totally interested in. I think a lot of lighting people would be to actually see performances live in person and not have to, mm -hmm. you know, go all over to mm -hmm. different facilities. It's all at one place. Yeah. But then to yeah. know it and it'd have to be some sort of organized tour and all that and explained. But Right, right. Yeah, we might try to do that again. I mean, we did try to, um, you know, we've had, you know, we always speak at Leducation uh, and, and sometimes we'll have you know, an opportunity for people who are involved in that, you know, do you want to come, come see the, come see the living lab. I mean, we are spread out in a couple of different buildings uh, at, at Parsons. So it's not, you know, it's a little bit of a logistical, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, pro process to do that. But I, I do think what, what you're bringing up here has turned out to be one of the most important things that have come out of all this research is to be able to compare side by side how manufacturers are approaching this problem and and what they're doing and how they're doing it and how it differs you know um it, it when you're trying to figure out whether you're going to use one of these systems and whether you want to step into these waters just to know to see a table even if you don't know the name of the manufacturer associated with it now if it's if it's just general information, we will put the manufacturer's name, you know, like how they're doing their wall controls or what kind of what kind of phone app do they, you know, there's no positive or negative about that. So we will, you know, name names. Um, but it is really valuable to, to get your head around um, how all the different, and it's actually one of the main problems, right? Electricians can't, if the systems are so different and you have to approach them so differently and it's a brand new learning curve every time, that's a real hindrance for these systems getting getting uh, installed and, and implemented. So we're hoping maybe some of this will help <laughs> coalesce um you know so, some of this haha ha, i know um but we we just figure a few things maybe we could standardize like like wall controls we had a very um interesting user exercise in which we asked we had both students and um judges lighting professionals had to come into the room one at a time without seeing what anyone else has done and get get the lighting system to work to, to the spec um uh, <laughs> that would be do. funny and, to watch. And, That's like a, a yeah, funny was, show you can watch, eh? Like you can watch it on we, TV. We have some, <laughs> we have some really good, really good video uh, uh, of all of it because it's a, uh, it, yeah, they couldn't for, for the most part they couldn't figure it out and, and there were and totally different issues between you know a 55 year old and a, and a 20 year old um and coming in and what they assume are a person who has lighting background and doesn't have lighting background or are did they grow up in the united states or did they grow up in some other country in which lighting controls mean something totally different they i mean even the most basic things were not a given um in this that people got confused Hmm. Have you ever had to, had to uh, kick a manufacturer out or tell them your product is so bad that you can't, you got to get out of my lab? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> yes. And 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 it wasn't. I mean, of course, I'm not going to name any names. The, no. the problem was the product just didn't. Um, we really shouldn't have let them in. I mean, they, they it, on the apples to apples thing, we, we, we wanted to see it because it was different, but it was like, we shouldn't have let them in. So it's not that we wouldn't let that company maybe come in in a different kind of study, but, and then we had all, we just had so many problems with, with that system that Parsons said, yeah, we, we need something else in here. And so we just replaced that room with an entirely different system, but only that one. But we do have several other systems that we have said, 
they're definitely on probation. And either you get this system to work or we're pulling it out or you upgrade it with something else that works. So we have had that happen. Nice. And then as far as cost, I know that's not a real huge factor, but who pays for it? And do they give, give you the product or is that part of the manufacturer's responsibility? Yes, they they do provide uh, the product. We provide, okay. uh, we pay the installers. So, you know, we want pretty, con, you know, control over that. We did want them to be not familiar with any system. We had different teams in each room. So they weren't learning as they, they went. And, you know, because then they get to the six system and they got this thing down. We, you know, we wanted that to be as comparable uh, as, as possible. So um, we we pay for that part of it subcontract with those installers you know in my career so i've been in the lighting game 22 years okay um that well maybe longer but that's a whole other that's a podcast <laughs> in its, on its own um but you know i've seen three controls boom bust cycles okay so one around 2000 or so when they came out with microphonic and all these different other kinds of sensors and you know relay systems and all that and you know a little niche market came out of that there were some applications and then you had the Incilium crowd of oh we're going to plug cat5 cable into every light fixture and every sensor that was like 2010 to 13 and now we're in the third iteration of this kind of boom bust cycle where it's like, yes this is going to go nobody wants to buy it right, right so there's like this cycle to this my belief ruth okay on all of this is that when the when we're in the matrix when the lighting is the internet okay and so you're literally those are the ones in the zeros li fi is an example of like an early example of how light can be can send internet connections and that internet can recognize you know who you are have facial recognition by your gait or your face or whoever you are that and the information is valuable to somebody and the person who wants that information is going to pay for it. And they are like a Google type of company or an Amazon type of company. And you're not worried about the facility maintenance guy figuring out an app. And you're not worrying about the uh, electricians. They don't care because they're going to take care of everything. Because actually, they might even pay you to take it. That's how valuable this information <laughs> will be to them, right? And so when that arrives, then the boom bust cycle will come to an end and you'll see this everywhere. That's my belief. Um, and I don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to, except for outdoor. I believe outdoor, there's a massive business case for these types of controls right now. But in the interior environment, I don't know if, you know, if that, if there's going to be a business case in 2021 or 2022 with some of this stuff on the in the large buildings at this point but i do thank you for your research and your work i think that's <laughs> wonderful what you guys are doing there at pnnl i'm about to talk to andrea wilkerson in about an hour one of your colleagues so oh yes um, yeah, yeah we're gonna do she's gonna help us with some training so this is a little advertisement for evolve in the middle of the podcast andrea wilkerson's <laughs> gonna come do some training with ls evolve and teach us about queuing which is fascinating by the way so yeah, cool. thank you for being a guest on the show. Greg, any final thoughts or Ruth, any final thoughts before we, we call it? No, thanks for having I, me. This was good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think one, one thing to add in and I've said it before on sensors is this is peace of mind too. I think that's why people do it. Mm. You know, just to have peace of mind that their lighting is going to do what they want it to do when they need it to be done. And when that happens, it'll make sense. Folks, we thank you for listening. But before we go, we got to talk about the gangsters, Greg. Satco. We do. Go to satco.com, distributors. Come on, man. Those guys have everything, Greg. And they got the starfish. And we talked about it today on the show, how homes and businesses are different. At your home, a connected lighting system can and does make sense. And you know how I know? Because I have one, and I use it. So that's that's what what Starfish is all about. It's got color changing, uh, phone app control, and all the different light sources you need for your house. Check it out. You got to go to the people that they, they do the light thing. They do the right thing. That's s a t c o dot com. Proud members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. And that's right. We're going to do some courses on queuing and LS Evolve. Listen, folks. Queuing is right now ready to go. You want to sign up to Nailed and you want to get your people in LS Evolve because 
Andrea Wilkerson is amazing. She's been on the show and she's talked to us about this and now we're going to break it down. How to do queuing for your customers. Queuing is ready to go. That's right. You need to do it right now. I'm talking to you distributors out there. You need to learn about this because this is very valuable and it might be the most valuable thing with connected lighting at this point. So go to NALD.org. That's right. Sign up, join us, get associated. Thanks for listening from the bottom of my heart.